All right, I'd like to say that uh, kudos to the Microsoft guys, because if I was at a JS Conf, I would never want to open with, we're the guys who made IE. Uh, but <laughs> but the, I'm sure the latest IE is awesome, though. Uh, how many people here ever developed for IE6? Hands up. I wasn't those guys. All right, um, so uh, I work for ICE. We end up, uh, I'm a technical lead there. Um, I end up working on a lot of very complex business problems. And at work, uh, I wrote a couple of DSLs. Uh, part of my job is to coach other engineers on how to do their job. And uh, one of the things that I've uh, wanted to speak on, but I just hadn't had the time to pull a talk together, was writing custom DSLs. Um, so when there was a call for speakers at JSConf, I submitted it, got accepted, and somehow got to be the first for this track. Thank you very much, JSConf, for accepting me, and I'm honored to be uh, to kick off this conference. All right. Um, so uh, we're going to break up the talk into four sections. Uh, the evolutionary history of DSLs, to give us all some context to how we got there. Uh, what, what a DSL is, uh, defining your DSL's grammar, and implementing your DSL. All right, evolutionary history of DSLs. Uh, so for the history of programming, we've always been trying to create a machine language that reads like a human language. When we first started out, we said, uh, let's use punch cards. Um, fun fact, turns out punch cards have been used since the 17th century for programming looms. I didn't know that. And they were used all the way up until the 80s, until they invented monitors and keyboards. Um, Low-level languages, like assembly, that basically read like gibbledygook. Higher-level languages, where uh, we started to see human words, like if and else and end and do. Then we got even higher-level languages that allowed you to express things that were uh, again, more human and more natural. And that led us up to object-oriented languages. Now, object-oriented languages, or the, the purpose of them is that you can use them to represent uh, you know, real-world stuff, but in code, uh, by creating computer models. And domain modeling is the, you know, the, the, the methodology, if you will, of taking something that you see in the real world and making a computer model of it. Now, the fact is that doesn't happen, well, in my opinion, nearly often enough. But generally speaking, we tend to uh, just use you know, models. Uh, when it comes to models, we think of them as just data transfer objects. If you look at just about any framework out there, they're all saying, you know, here's how you use our models, and this is our models, and models, and models. And all they're, you know, most times, all they're really saying is, um, this is how you trans shuttle uh, data back, uh, back and forth. But when you actually do a domain model, when you actually model your domain, you end up with something that uh, is much you know, conceptually bigger and more important. And uh, the, the persistence layer, the database, the presentation layer, the user interface, tend to be much simpler in comparison. If you think of something like Bank of America and you, you know, or sorry, any, that's my bank. If you look at uh, any banking interface, you know, the, the stuff you see on the screen and the stuff that's going to Oracle or whatnot pales in comparison to all of the business logic that's responsible for transfers and international you know, monies and all the rest of that, the clearing that goes with it. When we talk about the MVC pattern, the M in MVC is uh, you know, they use the word model for a reason. They sort of want uh, your M to be your domain model um, so that it, you know, you, that is where all of your business logic lives, and then you've got these other ancillary things. To make a domain model, and by the way, that's, that's one of the many things I coach on is just how to get an engineer to start thinking about how to make your own domain model. I think it's relatively straightforward and simple, but it's... Um, uh, it's something that requires a lot of practice until it becomes second nature. Understand your domain, model your domain, implement your domain. Understanding your domain is uh, this process. It starts off with speaking to, with your customer and developing a mutual language. That is crazy important and will be a theme uh, for the rest of this talk. The model begins with this idea of uh, what is your domain so that I can understand it, so that I can build it. You can model your domain in UML. Uh, you just need a UML sketch. You don't need anything very complicated. Um, when you come to implementing your, your domain, you've got a series of choices that I'm going to take you through. One is you can sort of listen, uh, remember what you said, go back to your desk and just start typing and hope to God that you remembered everything properly. 
A better way to do it is to write your test first, then write your code to pass your test. But when you do that, when you uh, invert the order with which you, um, you code, meaning testing, testing first, you've got two choices that you can make there. For, um, I just got freaked out because there's a little green bar on my screen and then there's a little counter thing and they don't line up and I want them to. So <laughs> I'm gonna hold on, all right. I'm gonna keep going, there we go. Um, so you have a choice of writing tests by yourself or you have a choice of writing tests with the customer. When you write your tests by yourself, it's called test-driven development. When you write them with the customer, it's called behavior-driven development. This is an example of what a behavior-driven development set of spec tests look like. If you're working with your customer to develop these tests, as you should if you're modeling their domain, you're going to end up with a synergy between what they, how they're describing their expectations on what the domain is and the mutual language you two came up with. And when you do this enough, it's, it begins to occur to you that why are you, the programmer, even involved? Because their nirvana would be just let the customer in, uh, express their expectations directly in the code. And uh, that's what DSLs are for. Now, here's what a uh, DSL is. There's three aspects of a DSL. The grammar, those are the, it's the syntax and the words that make it up. Uh, the implementation, uh, which is the code that obviously implements it. And then the rules that, are, uh, that use the grammar to express something useful. We're very used to DSLs. We uh, SQL regular expressions in Unix shell scripts, they're all uh, DSLs. In the JavaScript community, we've got a, a really good culture of wrapping complex technical domains in DSLs. Um, jQuery, obviously, and some of my favorites. Uh, I love D3JS, uh, and I use Mocha Chai a lot. And uh, Gulp is something that, uh, well, Gulp is something that we're probably gonna switch to before too long at work. Um, so, DSLs, generally, all DSLs, they make complex problems simple. That's their goal. Um, SQL, for example, makes dealing with relational data uh, very simple. In the business world, there are lots of incredibly complex domains uh, that come from multiple industries. And when you think about the domain problems uh, in the business world, they're not just domain problems, they're domain problems within domain problems within domain problems. If you stop for a second and think about, well, what, how would I model health insurance? Um, you know, you can go as high up to, you know, the definition of a policy and as low down to, you know, where, uh, what is the inventory of this pill versus the generic pill and when should I use the generic pill when it's not an inventory and things like that. The key difference between business DSLs and, uh, and technical DSLs is that the business DSLs come from the customer, uh, meaning the grammar of the DSL, it comes from the customer. When you're developing a technical DSL, you, as the programmer, pretty much know everything you need to know. But for a business DSL, you need to get it from, hopefully, the subject matter expert. So to illustrate that, I'm gonna take you through defining uh, a DSL's grammar. So the easiest way I thought to explain this is with a semi-real world example, where we're going to take our lovable security guard, Paul, with our customer, Chuck, and we're gonna use an alarm system as the domain model. So the idea for this exercise is to say that uh, Chuck is gonna work with uh, Paul to configure the alarm system. So in this way, this is what these business DSLs are trying to do. Think of uh, an alarm system like the domain model or the state machine where its behavior changes based upon how you configure it. Um, so the idea is that Chuck is going to tell Bob to configure a alarm domain model. Now I'm saying the same thing repeatedly because I want to drive this point home. <sighs> the alarm has lots of different intricate pieces that are within it and uh, everything from smoke alarms to motion detectors and things like that. The key there is Chuck really doesn't care about any of that. And the way in which he asks for the alarm to be configured is as follows, having a conversation uh, with Paul. Hey Paul, how's it going? Yesterday our office admin came in early to set up for the company's weekly status meeting, but he couldn't remember the code to turn off the alarm. The cops had to come out and he tried to explain that he was an employee because he had a key, but didn't believe him and ended up calling me. 
we have the same meeting every Monday uh, morning, so can we just not have the alarm set so he doesn't need, uh, doesn't need the alarm code to get in? So Paul goes ahead and Liz tries to remember that long conversation, goes back to his you know, little management console and, and does his best to uh, configure the alarm system as he remembered Paul saying it. Uh, sorry, as he remembered Chuck saying it. And of course, Chuck comes back and says, hey, Paul, what's up? I know I asked you not to have the alarm set for our weekly status meetings, but during Memorial Day, I was worried that we had the alarm off when we should have had it on. I had a friend of mine whose business got robbed on July 4th because I, I guess they figured no one would be there. So this back and forth is pretty much what it means to be a programmer, unfortunately. And I, I would say it's probably my least favorite part of uh, writing software is this is this, uh, this back and forth that happens. Maybe some people like it, I personally don't like it, and that's why I got good at writing TSLs, is I wanted to not do this anymore. And Paul reaches the same conclusion. He says, you know what, if I could just let Chuck configure his own alarm system, then I'd be, I'd be out of this game and much happier. So the way we do this is to build a grammar based upon what uh, Chuck has said, is we'll just review the conversation that we had with him, and we'll drop out all the words that really don't mean anything. They're just, you know, they're just transitionary words that don't carry useful information. And then we'll split up the nouns and the verbs. Um, now I'm using verb and noun a little bit loosely here. I'm not a, I was never an English major. Uh, run with it, I think you guys know what I'm trying to say there. Um, so we, what nouns, you know, physical things, verbs, stuff you do to stuff. Um, we're gonna go ahead and clean up that grammar um, we'll just flip back to that for a second. So we have nouns like our, uh, office admin, code, alarm, yesterday, early, weekly. This is, this is the raw material from which you're going to pull your grammar out of. So now that we have this, we're going to start to dig in and apply some common sense to it, right? So it seems that we have things and then we have time. So I'm gonna you know, make some edits here and say, rather Paul is gonna make some edits here. Um, our really means company, um, you know, office admin really means employee and role, et cetera, et cetera. Set is really when he said set the alarm, it's a synonym for, you know, on. Uh, and then we have early, I, I make some assumptions about what early is. Weekly uh, means every and week. Um, every Monday morning, actually, you can combine uh, different things we already have, like every and day and, and a time range. For Memorial Day and July 4th, we have an opportunity to use an idiom. Idioms are uh, the most powerful technique you have when writing a DSL for simplification. An idiom is a word or a phrase with some implied useful meaning. For, uh, for us, when he said Memorial Day, when he said Independence Day, he probably just meant federal holiday. He was just being too specific. So I'm going to make the decision, Paul's going to make the decision, to replace the specifics of Memorial Day and Independence Day uh, with just federal holiday. So I go back, update the grammar sheet again. It's looking pretty clean, looking, you know, uh, pretty obvious. Now what I have to do is go back, Paul, I'm sorry. I, believe it or not, there is no Paul, actually. I made this presentation. Um, the, uh, we're going to reconstruct the... Uh, no one laughed at that, and that's okay. That's when everybody know that. That's cool. Um, the, I'm going to reconstruct what uh, Chuck wanted with my new grammar, and it turns out that it's just alarm on weekdays, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., alarm off Mondays, etc., alarm uh, on federal holidays, and I actually introduced another idiom of weekdays, which I take to mean, you know, every Monday or Friday. That's probably what uh, Chuck means. So now I put back in uh, some transitionary human words, and we get the alarm system should be on every weekday between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., but the alarm should be off Mondays from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. Also, the alarm should be on for federal holidays. Wonderful. This seems good. Now all we gotta do is go back to Chuck and go review it with him. And Chuck says, yeah, that's pretty good. Only thing is, uh, we don't close for Columbus Day, because Columbus was a bit of a tool. And I'm from Bahamas, by the way, so that's where Columbus actually uh, landed. Yes, born and bred. Uh, until I went to college, um, and uh, we celebrated Columbus Day all the time. And uh, he's, he wasn't that cool a person. Um, so I add into uh, the, the grammar, but not for Columbus Day. Then I go back to the grammar sheet again, and I get rid of stuff that I just didn't need to express what Chuck wanted. 
Um, for example, uh, no need for company employee role. All I need is the only thing that matters is the alarm. Um, I don't need should. Uh, I need not, on and off. I don't need day every and week because the, the idiom of weekdays covers everything with a specific parameter of Mondays, federal holiday specific parameter of Columbus Day, and then some time ranges. Um, so uh, now we have our tightened up grammar sheet and we're sort of ready to go, right? We have everything we need, ready to start implementing. Um, and it turns out that Paul is taking night courses in uh, programming and he just so happens to uh, be learning JavaScript. So Paul's decided that he's gonna take it on, he's gonna implement his own DSL. So he gets on Google and gets immediately freaked out. Uh, because what, you know, compilers, lectures, you know, parsers, what, what does this all mean? Doesn't make much sense to him. And this is actually one of the hurdles that I tend to help engineers get over as much as I can, which is just relax. You know, over time, you're gonna wanna use more advanced techniques to implement DSLs, but um, Paul's gonna make the decision that I encourage all of you who've never done this before to make, which is, I'm gonna choose method chaining. Um, the method chaining, uh, when it's used to implement DSLs, like jQuery, for example, most JavaScript uh, DSLs tend to use method chaining. It's called a fluent interface. That's its proper, uh, the proper name for it. So we'll start off with the simplified, you know, Paul doesn't want to go after the, uh, you know, the full human readable text. I'll make another, uh, in the later slide, I'll show you how to deal with that. But he starts off with this basic DSL sheet, and then he, adds in, oh sorry, basic grammar sheet, and then he adds in uh, the, the syntax he needs to make it into executable code. Uh, then he kicks it off with a builder object. Now, if you guys are familiar with the builder pattern, uh, it's basically an object that you configure that then produces an object, which is great, because that's actually what we want. We want to get a configured domain model based upon Chuck's uh, configurations, effectively. And that's at the very end, we're gonna say, you know, call the build method, in this case, build a configured domain model. For uh, JavaScript in particular, you've got, uh, and I, you know, any multi-paradigm language like JavaScript is gonna give you this ability. You've got two different ways um, that are very complementary that you can use to capture state. Um, you know what? That clock is counting down. It's not counting up. I've got a lot more time. Oh wait, I don't have as much time. I don't know. But it's okay, we're doing well either way. I got the green bar, I got the clock freaking me out. All right. Um, well, thank you all. And, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, that threw me off. Uh, so you can inject data uh, into object construction um, uh, just like you would, and you know, this is a fairly typical way to do it. But you can also use uh, function composition as methods. And this is something I abuse a lot, especially for performance tuning. Oftentimes, if you just use state, you'll end up having to go through this very complex you know, if-else tree to get to what you really need. You know, once you understand what you need, just take whatever method you were gonna result with and just pin it on to the front of, uh, of the call chain. Um, and that's, you know, that's my primary way of, uh, of performance tuning um, at DSLs that run all the time. Um, all right, and with that, Paul's written a custom DSL. And that's, uh, that's, that's terrific, and we're all very proud of Paul. Um, now, quick review of the steps he followed. He, he reviewed, meaning that you know, in our particular case, he must have recorded uh, Chuck and then got it transcribed for 80 bucks uh, online. But he reviewed the conversation with the customer. He removed meaningless words. He separated the nouns and verbs. He identified idioms. He reviewed the grammar with the customer, and then he implemented the grammar. Now, to make sure that every, every one of you can leave and begin writing your own DSLs, we're gonna start fresh, and this is sort of your final exam. We're gonna implement your DSL and we're gonna choose shipping. Now shipping is one of these domains that seems simple if there's one package that's going to you, but shipping is um, a fairly complex and complicated uh, domain, especially when you get into things like um, domestic shipping, international shipping, you, your order has to be shipped from multiple warehouses to get, for you, uh, get to you. It might go from carrier to carrier. Um, there's, there's a ton of little subtleties that go into thinking about the domain of uh, what, goes into, um, uh, what goes into shipping. Um, now, for, the, for this talk, I, I whipped up this domain model, and this, is, and this is something else I want to mention. 
I, I did this with Visual Paradigm. It doesn't matter. Just use any modeling tool. But this whole thing took me maybe about 10 minutes to put together. So over time, the more models you make, the faster you're going to get at it. Um, I, you, know, you can do this on a whiteboard. It really doesn't matter. Um, but the bottom line here is that I've got relationships that, uh, that mirror the yeah, because I'm looking at this clock. This clock is a terrible idea. For anybody who's speaking, you've just got this red thing just blinking at you the whole time. But um, I'll do my bit. Maybe if I scooch down and I can't see it. No. All right. So it's got interesting relationships like there. Like a, I'm sure it's impossible to read, but either way, um, take my word for it. It's got interesting relationships. Uh, so this is the actual shipping DSL grammar. Right? This is the grammar that you know, someone went through that hard process of, of pulling the grammar out of some business owner who was in charge of it. And it turns out, for all the complexities of that domain model, they just don't care about it. The bottom line of calculating shipping cost, which is, which is what this business owner has asked us to do, comes down to these pretty simple rules. When shipping domestically, if the delivery date is flexible, ship as cheaply as possible. If delivery date is specified, just pass the shipping cost on the customer. When shipping internationally, then ship as cheaply as possible. Fairly simple. So the steps we're going to go through to actually implement this are uh, we're going to dump the junk words. We're going to throw in the syntactical constructs we need to do method chaining. And then we're going to uh, preface it with a builder and end it with a build function. So here's, here we go. So I'm going to start out with just a text area, just you know, something that, let's say, that our uh, owner would actually be inputting it themselves. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Just you need to hold, grab hold of that text. Uh, here I'm just grabbing it and then trimming it. Uh, here I'm grabbing it and trimming it. Uh, then we'll just use regular expressions to rip out all the words that we just don't care about. And when I say don't care about, it's that they don't matter for the, for the configuration of the domain. They matter to the human being, but they just don't matter for the configuration of the domain. Uh, then we replace the white space with um, our parens dot. And what we're going to do is, because to, to construct the final executable string, um, I need a, a, an API for the builder. So I'm just going to use a stubbed builder here. And um, you'll notice that even though it's a stub, and stub meaning it doesn't do anything, it just conforms to that API, th this is an important point. All it's doing is just returning this every time, right? And that's how method chaining works. So now what I do is to create the DSL code that's going to get executed and going to configure our domain model, I'm going to uh, preface it with a, uh, or rather, I'm going to concatenate DSL builder dot with the parens in the middle, um, with the parens on the end. And then I'm just going to eval it. And when, of course, I eval it, I end up with my builder object. So now let's look at the builder object. Um, now, uh, my, my wife, my beautiful wife, was my main reviewer for this. And she learned a lot about DSLs in this talk. She's got a PhD, so she's smarter than me. Um, but uh, after she got to this point in the talk, she said, you need to show an implementation. And I said, how do you even know what an implementation is? Um, but nonetheless, this is brought to you by my wife, who said, you need to actually code something so people can, uh, can see it. I said, all right. Um, so let's see how clear that is. Can anyone make out that text at all? I bet you can't in the back. Um, but I'll skim through it really quick. I'm not going to dwell on this for too long. Um, interestingly, on the screen, it's shrunk down. So I can barely read it. So let me lean in. All right, it's cool. So we've got rules, which is an internal array, um, a convenience method of get current rule, which just says, what am the current, what rule am I currently working on? Um, I have a when method there that, uh, that kicks off the rules. So if you remember, it says um, when internationally, when domestically. That starts off the rule. So all I do is I just add an empty object there. For domestically and for internationally, I grab the current rule, and I just tack on a property that's a Boolean flag of is domestic and toggle it appropriately, true or false. And this kicks off any rules. So you can add as many rules as you want. Then I get into the if. You know, I promised myself in this talk I wouldn't use then and then if, because it'd be confusing, but I just did. I'm, I apologize. So then, I'm doing it again. Um, you can't use if because it's a, it's a reserved word, so you just use uh, square brackets to use it. Um, you grab the current rule. If the conditions are already there, then, uh, then you use them. Otherwise, you uh, assign them to empty array. 
You push that onto the conditions, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry I'm reading code, but I, it's very fascinating to me, I suppose. Um, then is just a synonym for if, so I just assign it back to each other. Uh, and then with uh, get current condition, another convenience method that just grabs the nth condition just like we grabbed the nth uh, rule. And then for the rest of the DSL, it's just a simple matter of grabbing the current condition, adding the appropriate properties, um, and then returning this as, I, as we were before so we can keep the method chain going. And then finally, we just call build. And in this particular case, our shipping cost calculator uh, constructs its own domain, and all we have to do is just give it the, the rules array that looks like this um, when you serialize it. Um, so it's a very consumable thing by something that's configuring and constructing a domain. Um, now, one of the, the most uh, important, I mean, all right, in my opinion, the most useful and important aspect of all DSLs is that as time goes on, your uh, your actual domain, the domain model behind the scenes, will get more and more and more complex. It just happens over time. But the DSL, because it came from you know, a human thinking about the problem, tends to remain uh, more or less uh, consistent, if you will, because there's a limit to how complex humans can think of things, but there's no limit to how complex things can actually be. For example, one day, hopefully, uh, we're going to have packages that can be delivered with drones. So when that day comes, we will have a rich, very complicated uh, domain model uh, behind the scenes that deals with all types of things like weather and battery charge and route and, uh, you know, uh, was it FAA, uh, you know, regulations and stuff like that. But the bottom line is this. When you're shipping with drones, if the weather is favorable, send as cheaply as possible. Otherwise, just ship it domestically. All right, that is... Uh, the main part of my talk, if you'd like to learn more, these are the books I recommend to the engineers that I work with. Design patterns, so you can get your uh, object-oriented concepts grounded. Test-driven development, so that you actually know properly how to do it. Um, Kent Beck's first half is, every, every time I hear someone say test development sucks, I go, have you read a book on the material, and have you actually read the book on the material? And the answer is no. And universally, when they come back to me, they say, Oh, I get it. I didn't get it until I actually saw someone step me through it. Um, Domain-Driven Design, it's a huge, very important book. Probably if you only read one book, I'd read that one. Patterns of Enterprise uh, Architecture speaks about model view controller and then get, keeps going on and on and on and on about different ways to structure application. And then, of course, Domain-Specific Languages, which came out relatively recently, um, which gives you patterns for talking about DSLs. And that is it. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>